listening to an offer you can't refuse, a podcast that will focus on the history of organized crime in the United States. I'm your host, Ryan S. Pettengill. Whether you listened to the trailer and bought in, or you stumbled across us and it looked like something that you might be interested in listening to, we're glad to have you along for the ride. I mentioned this in the trailer, but this podcast will take an academic approach to the history of organized crime. And to that end, we will situate its history within the broader context of American history. And now we're ready to get started. This episode, entitled Beginnings, Frederica Marm Mandelbaum, New York City and the Origins of Organized Crime in America, 1845-1900, to 1900, will offer up a starting point to our story and include an example for our frame of reference. In any case, I hope you enjoy it, and welcome to our maiden voyage. Starting points are difficult, they just are, and they can be agonizing for historians. How much does the reader need to know before she or he can really understand the rest of the story that you're trying to tell? And unfortunately, this issue is not just relegated to historians. I bet you've had this experience before at some point in time. Where do you begin an important conversation that you're trying to have with someone? You know, it's not the easiest thing to decide upon. But one tactic that I've used both in my classes as well as in my scholarship is to ask a question. So that's what I'm going to do now. The question that I have for you is relatively simple. What is organized crime? What sets it apart from petty criminals or random acts of crime? What makes it unique? What makes it different? And that's the question that I'll come back to again and again and again throughout the course of this podcast, but also throughout the course of this episode today. I've studied organized crime for some time now, and I believe that there are four tenets of organized crime that sets it apart from other forms of crime, and I'd like to go through those tenets with you now. The first one, and I'm not trying to be funny or cute or anything, the first tenet of organized crime is organization. The acts that you carry out to pull off whatever said goal that you're trying to pull off have to be organized. They cannot be haphazard. You need coordination. You need compartmentalization. And you need hierarchy. And you'll see an example of what I'm talking about a little bit later here today. Another tenet of organized crime that sets it apart from other acts of crime would be coordination. In many instances, you will see several actors who are working together toward a shared goal. And in other instances, you will see actors who will essentially pool their various skills or talents to achieve this goal you might have someone who is really, really effective at laundering money, for example, teaming up with someone who's really, really effective uh, at cracking safes at banks. And I'm, I'm sure you can see where I'm going with respect to coordination. And you need it if organized crime is going to be effective. The next one's a big one. You need complacency. In many instances, you need people in power, whether they're politicians or law enforcement officials, to acquiescence to your will. Or if not acquiesce, then you, you, you need them to, at the very least, look the other way. And you also need rule followers to look the other way or just, you know, essentially let you get away with cheating without reporting you. Um... And the last tenet of organized crime, at least in my opinion, would be not standing out. You need most of the others, 
to follow the rules. If everyone's breaking the law, it's going to bring too much attention from law enforcement. You also don't want to stand out in the crowd, and most of the individuals that we'll talk about uh, will figure this out pretty quickly. Less attention is better, and it's always better. And so it's these four tenets that essentially um, put organized crime apart from other forms of criminality. So now we need an example. And there's an individual that encompasses all of these tenets. Um, there's a reason that I chose her to start out with. Uh, but I'm guessing you probably wouldn't have guessed on this individual before you started listening to this podcast. Uh, before we get going, though, I want to go back to starting points. Um, starting points are, are very difficult, but, you know, I think very abstractly about starting points, and there's a physicality to starting points that I like to, you know, bring up in my classes as well. And the physical location of this starting point is going to be Union Field Cemetery, which is located in Brooklyn, New York. Why Union Field Cemetery? Well, it's the final resting spot of Frederica Marm Mandelbaum. And as we're going to find out, Mandelbaum was one of the earliest pioneers of organized crime in the United States. Part of the reason that I chose to focus on her in the beginning is that she encompasses all of these tenets of organized crime. And she is an incredibly vivid and early example of organized crime in the U.S., Mandelbaum is going to be a huge player um, in, 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 in launching organized crime and activity in the United States. But before we can really get into the finer details of her life and activity, we need to discuss the setting. In, 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 the, in, in the discipline of history, context is everything. And the context of Frederica Mandelbaum happens to be New York City in the Gilded Age. It's impossible to understand the world that produced Frederica Mandelbaum without first having an understanding of the history of New York City. So let's take a deep dive into the early history of the Big Apple. For those of you that have studied American history, you can tell me that New York does not begin its life as part of the English North American Empire. Originally, it belonged to the Dutch, and these are people from Northwest Europe, a country known as the Netherlands. And the modern-day states of New York and New Jersey, as well as other parts of other states throughout that region, were once upon a time uh, a part of the Dutch imperial network that was commonly known as New Netherlands. The capital of New Netherlands was an island off the coast of the mainland that the Dutch referred to as New Amsterdam. And I really want to impress this point upon you. It's going to be a very important point, not just for today, but for the rest of this series. Uh, New Amsterdam was a center of trade. Even before Europeans showed up in the Western Hemisphere, indigenous peoples had used it as an important center of trade because it had a world-class harbor. It was easy to get into and easy to get out of, and naturally that made it a very convenient place to do business. Now, speaking of business, that's going to be one thing that really sets the Dutch apart of the story of colonization that we, as Americans, are used to, and that's the model of colonization that is going to be based on commerce. The Dutch are going to base making money in the New World, base that on commerce, buying and selling of goods. Now, the story that most of us are used to is agriculture, whether that's tobacco farming in Virginia or small family farms throughout New England. We're used to that story primarily because the English were the dominant group of Europeans that came over and carved up North America. There's another aspect of the Dutch model that you need to be aware of because it's going to play an important role in not only this podcast, but really throughout our series as well. And that's the fact that New York City is going to become an incredibly diverse place. The reason for that is 
Unlike the English, who attracted all kinds of people throughout the British Isles that were willing to take a chance and come over to the New World, become landowners, the Dutch couldn't give land away. Try as they might, they could not attract settlers to come over there to the New Netherlands and set up shop. So essentially what they're going to do is they're going to broaden their net and they're going to recruit really throughout Europe, certainly Central Europe, uh, Western Europe, but even Southern and Eastern Europe. Uh, we are going to see immigrants coming over to what we call the Dutch Empire in the New World. Many of them are going to really establish themselves in New Amsterdam, the capital of uh, the colonial network. And as a result, you're going to have a lot of different people from a lot of different walks of life living under one roof. You're essentially going to have transnational identities, different ethnicities, different religions, different nationalities, lots of different languages that were spoken on the streets of New Amsterdam. So in 1664, what's going to happen, and a lot of historians are sort of on this same page, certainly I am, it's inevitable. The English are going to take New Netherlands, including New Amsterdam. It was closing in on the Dutch. In any case, what's going to happen is the Dutch network is going to be ceded over there to the English, and the English are going to rename New Amsterdam New York City. And it's essentially going to become a part of the English North American Empire. But what the English got when they took New Amsterdam was probably the most diverse center in their North American network. Now, on any given day, Philadelphia would have something to say for that, but that's another story for another episode. The point that I'd like to impress upon you before we go any further is New York was always a center of trade from its earliest days, and it was also always a very diverse center from its earliest of days. There's a couple of connections that I really want to establish before we go much further here. And those connections involve New York City. Um, and, and there's a reason why I'm focusing so deliberately on New York. And it's not just because New York happens to be the, uh, the setting for this particular episode. But you're going to find out very quickly that in so many ways, New York is the epicenter of organized crime in the United States. You have to keep in mind that part of the reason for this is that New York is, was, and always has been a center of trade. It's a place where business gets done for reasons that we've already talked about. New York is, was, and always has been a city of immigrants from its earliest days before it was even part of the English Empire, let alone the United States. It was a city of immigrants. And those two connections are, are very much intertwined. Let, let me explain. One of the more important people with respect to the economic history of the United States is an immigrant in his own right, a guy by the name of Alexander Hamilton. And Hamilton, as some of you may know, is going to serve as America's first Secretary of the Treasury. Now, unlike Thomas Jefferson, who very much favored a farming-based, agrarian economy, Hamilton favored an industrial-based economy. Like the British, what he wanted was Americans to produce goods and sell those goods all across the world and get rich in the process. But America had a problem that Britain just simply didn't have. We didn't have enough workers. We didn't have enough labor. And so one thing Hamilton's going to do uh, when George Washington, the first president of the United States, appoints him as Secretary of the Treasury, he'll issue a collection of reports. And one report I want to focus on here is his report on manufacturers. Hamilton not only points out the benefits of an industrial-based economy, he encourages the United States to go throughout Europe and recruit an army of workers, bring those immigrant workers back to the United States, and plug them into the factories. And he's very clear as to why. Immigrants are cheap labor. They can get a lot of bang for their buck because many of these people are financially desperate. Some of them, um, you know, are, are fleeing and are desperate to get out of those countries. 
And some of them are looking for new opportunities and are willing to work for cheap. So he sees a real bargain with respect to an immigrant workforce. Now, let me give an example of how central immigrants are with respect to the development of the economy. Like I said, New York is an industrial center. It's a city of commerce, but it's also a place where products get produced. And in so many ways, you could make a case that New York was the workshop of the United States in the early history of uh, the United States. And at the same time, you're beginning to see the U.S. march westward, okay? Uh, state, future states like Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, their, their populations are beginning to boom. People are trying to go out west and take advantage of that cheap land. And they're, they're paying money hand over fist for their products. And New Yorkers would love nothing more than to be able to tap into those Midwestern markets and sell those people their goods at a much cheaper price. And to be clear, the Midwesterners would love to buy them at cheaper prices. The problem is we don't have a great way to get the goods out of New York and into the Midwest. Until New Yorkers develop this concept that we call the Erie Canal. Now, if you know anything about a canal, you can tell me that it's a man-made body of water that connects two or more other natural bodies of water. So New York is on the eastern seaboard, and what we were going to see here is a canal that connects the waterways, the natural waterways of New York together until they dump into Lake Erie and open up the entire Midwestern Basin, the Great Lakes Basin. Once you hit those Great Lakes, think about all of the areas that they touch. All of a sudden, the market expands and it expands exponentially. But think about the kind of work we're asking people to do here. Uh, there's a reason why the expression digging ditches is associated with hard, backbreaking labor. I think you see where I'm going with this. In 1817, we're going to see the, you know, construction of the Erie Canal begin. And I'm here to tell you that that, that project would not have been built had it not been for immigrant labor predominantly coming out of Ireland. Uh, we'll talk about this here in just a minute, but there are thousands and thousands of Irish that begin uh, emigrating to the United States. And it's only going to pick up throughout the course of the 1800s. And because they're willing to work for cheap and because they're willing to accept these difficult jobs, it's going to allow for the construction of the Erie Canal, which in so many different ways is going to open up even more economic opportunities for producers that would like to sell their, their products to consumers in distant marketplaces. And speaking of those consumers, it's also going to raise the general standard of living. So... What I want you to understand here is that there has always been this continuous need for cheap labor in American economic history. And America had always attracted people seeking opportunities, sometimes out of desperation and sometimes not. But throughout American history, these newcomers have not often been treated all that well. Let me explain what I mean. As I was saying, even as important as immigrants have been to the economic development of the United States, many immigrant groups have not been treated especially well um, in American history. Uh, I'm going to give you a couple different examples here in a moment. Uh, one group I'm going to cover relatively briefly because we will go through the Irish as a group and the processes of Irish immigration later on in this podcast. The other group we're going to spend some time on, and they're going to be very central, as you'll see, with respect to this podcast. But in any case, I want to start out with the case of the Irish. Um, a little known fact about English colonization is that Ireland is one of the first places that the English are going to colonize. It's going to go all the way back into the 1500s, and England is basically going to claim the island nation that we call Ireland. And so 
what you're going to begin to see here is the process of English colonization, which is generally meant to extract the wealth from the colonized country and funnel all that wealth back into the mother country or the colonizing country, if you follow me. So what begins to happen is the English set up these landlords who begin to collect rents. And in some cases, those rents involve currency, like you and I would understand currency. And in other instances, it involves things like meat, uh, be it beef or uh, lamb or lamb's wool, uh, things of that variety. That's the wealth that I'm talking about that's all going back to London and it's making the English economy explode. At the same time, it's eroding not only the Irish standard of living, but the Irish quality of life as well. Uh, because all of that meat and other sustenance is going back to London, uh, the Irish are existing predominantly on a potato diet, right? Upwards of 90%, in some instances, 90% of the Irish diet is made up of potatoes. And beginning in the 1840s, that crop, the potato crop, is going to begin to fail. And when it does, you see widespread hunger, widespread starvation. And so, in a way, the Irish are essentially pushed out of their country because they don't have anywhere else to turn. In a way, they're economic refugees, and given the booming American economy, this was a place that was hiring. So economic opportunity is pulling the Irish in at the same time that the potato famine is pushing them out. Now, when the Irish get here, they're treated as second-class citizens. And part of the reason for this, on the one hand, is the English referred to the Irish as an inferior race. And I understand that that might be a little bit difficult for us as Americans to kind of conceptualize, but the English very much referred to the Irish as not only a race, but an inferior race. And because the United States had really been influenced by Great Britain and in a way shared a similar culture, we inherited a lot of these anti-Irish bigotries. But one of the biggest anti-Irish bigotries uh, perpetrated by whether the, the United States or Great Britain uh, was an anti-Catholic bias, an anti-Catholic bigotry. Ireland was a great Catholic nation, and these Irish immigrants were coming into a nation that really was defining itself as a Protestant nation, a nation that kind of looked at itself and said, you can't really be a good American unless you happen to be Protestant. If you're Catholic, then maybe your first allegiance is not to the Constitution, maybe it's to the papacy in Rome, okay? So it wouldn't have been anything out of the ordinary at all to see a sign hanging in a shopkeeper's window, help wanted, Irish need not apply. Worse uh, was the process of Irish ghettoization. If you were to go to New York today and visit the fashion district, uh, a very posh center in New York City, uh, it would be kind of hard to imagine that once upon a time, that was one of the toughest neighborhoods in all of the city. It was referred to as Hell's Kitchen. Poverty was pervasive. Crime was uh, very widespread. And it was home to the Irish district. And the reason it was home was it was really the only place that the Irish were allowed to exist in the city. Okay. You'll see this with other immigrant groups, uh, one that's coming up, and you'll also see it in other cities as well. So the Irish were a huge source of essential labor throughout the 19th century. Uh, had they not come over in the numbers that they did, you wouldn't have railroads or infrastructure. Uh, many Irish were used in the infantry during the Civil War, and that's to say nothing of the hundreds of thousands of Irish that uh, made up the factory populations in America's cities. But for our purposes, the case involving the Germans is going to be even more central for today's uh, session. 
Now, before we go any further, understand that Germany is not the Germany that you think of uh, today, right? Uh, really, since the fall of the Roman Empire, uh, Germany is made up of not only little miniature kingdoms, but kingdoms that really thought of themselves as independent from one another. And for much of European history, from the fall of Rome right up through the 19th century, these kingdoms are going to go to war with one another. Germany was not only not unified, in, in, in ways it was exploited by other European countries, especially the French. And really it's not going to be until the early 19th century when the German peoples understand that Napoleon Bonaparte of France uh, it represents a far bigger threat than these other Germanic kingdoms do, it's, it's only going to be then that the German peoples begin to think of this concept of German unity, okay? Uh, but here's the problem. Nationalism can, can be a good thing. It can unite people and bring people together, as it did for the Germans fighting a common enemy. It also has a darker side. It puts people to thinking, you know, what exactly is it that makes someone German, okay? Uh, what kind of food does a German eat? Uh, what kind of dialect of German, as in the language, does a good German speak? And, you know, maybe most centrally of all, what kind of religion does a good German practice? keep in mind, we are talking about the land of Luther, and similar to the United States, uh, a lot of German people are, are defining German nationalism along religious, uh, religious lines. So if you happen to be a German Catholic, and there was a significant uh, amount of the population who were, uh, you're looked upon suspiciously. You're looked upon as someone who might not be as loyal, uh, as dutiful of a German as you could be. The other group that is really looked upon suspiciously would be the German Jews. And very quickly, after German, Germany becomes unified and you begin to see the Germany that we think of today, you begin to see anti-Semitic laws that are going into practice. Laws that prevent Jews from going into certain professions, laws that prevent Jews from owning property, laws that make it more and more difficult just to exist on a day-to-day -day basis, and similar to the potato famine in Ireland, it's pushing people out. You've got state-sanctioned second-class citizenry in Germany. And so this religious bigotry is pushing people out at the same time that it's pretty common knowledge that there's this country in the world where they don't care who you call God. Uh, you have religious freedom. Uh, you have a guarantee that the, the central governing body, you know, Congress, will not make a law that makes one religion or another religion the official state religion. And so you can practice your faith openly and without fear from the central state. And at the same time, of course, there's economic opportunity to ply your trade when you get there. So, similar to the Irish, what you begin to see are Germans pouring out of Europe and being pulled into these industrial centers, and New York is going to receive millions and millions of Germans over the course of the 19th century. So, what I want to do now is talk about these Germans of New York City. And these are people that are entering into a changing economy. In any time, you've got a, an economy that's in transition and you've got a scarcity of jobs or you've got economic turmoil of any kind, immigrants, newcomers are blamed before any other group, even though they're providing, as we've established, this very central service to the economy. Okay? And so... All of the things that we were talking about with respect to the Irish in anti-Catholic sentiment, uh, Catholic Germans experience very similar sorts of discriminatory practices. It may even be worse for these German Jews. Um, many German Jews found that their emancipation from Germany and the anti-Semitism sponsored by the German state uh, was replaced by American anti-Semitism uh, at the same time. And so a good example that I can point to with respect to um, 
the at least social st- sanction, maybe even state sanctioned anti Semitism would be the Judengasse. And for all of you German speakers out there, you can tell me that the, the English translation of that word uh, comes down to Jew row. The Judengasse. Uh, traces its roots back to uh, 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 Germany, actually, back to the 15th century. And a lot of people typically point to Frankfurt, Germany, as the first of these German uh, neighborhoods, uh, streets. Generally speaking, what we're talking about is similar to Hell's Kitchen in that it's the only place in the city that these people are allowed to exist. And the, the, the Judengasse of New York City was this area known as Kleindeutschland. Again, if you speak German, you'll understand that that translates into Little Germany. But uh, very similar to the case that we've established with the Irish, a lot of these German immigrants were immigrating because they saw greater levels of freedom in the United States and come to find out the United States wasn't as free as it was cracked up to be. We've spent a lot of time establishing the context for this episode, and it's been very important, as I said before, you can't really understand the launching of organized crime unless you understand, you know, settings, including but not limited to New York City. But you're probably asking yourself, when are we going to get to that example that you promised us at the beginning of this episode? And that's where we're headed right now. I want to introduce you to what I consider to be the pioneer of organized crime in the United States, Frederica Mandelbaum, or as she was known amongst her associates, simply Marm. The Mandelbaums, as in Frederica and her husband, were some of these German Jews that we were talking about just a minute or so ago. They suffered from second-class citizenship in Germany. Uh, There were certain laws that held them back. And ultimately, it's this anti-Semitism that's going to push them out of Germany and into the United States. But I want to talk just a second about their life in Germany uh, because it's going to make a lot of sense as to why and how she's going to launch into the endeavors that she does when she hits New York. The Mandelbaums were peddlers, okay? And there was a good reason why they were peddlers. Number one, they were pretty good at it. They had established a pretty good trade in Germany. And I don't use the term trade by coincidence. It it does encompass a skill, knowing how to buy and sell. But generally speaking, what I'm talking about are, are, are people that will buy goods off of others who are selling and then turn around them and sell them to other buyers who are looking for a bargain. And the hope is you, you're, you're able to buy low, sell high, the classic adage, if you will. So these are individuals that are peddlers in Castle, Germany. And they became peddlers partly because there were certain laws in Germany at the time that did not allow Jews to go into certain trades. It wasn't as simple as, I think I'll be a blacksmith or I'd like to become a shoe cobbler or something along those lines, because these anti-Semitic laws, some of which were actually sponsored by the state, limited where you could go and what you could do if you happened to be of a certain ethnic or religious variety. And by 1850, the the, the Mandelbaums had had enough, um, and it was this anti-Semitic posture that simply pushed them out of Germany and into the United States. So they're going to emigrate to New York in 1850, and they'll settle in the German district. As I said before, this is Kleindeutschland, okay? Little Germany. I want to stop for just a second and revisit this whole issue of ghettoization because thus far I've really painted, you know, a pretty dark picture with respect to this process. Uh, Ghettoization was something that was forced on the Irish, forced on the Germans, forced on other immigrant groups and races throughout American history. And there's a large degree of truth to that. 
But there's another side to the story, and, and that side is some individuals purposefully chose to settle amongst their own kind. I mean, you have to think about this from their perspective for just a second. The fact was, German was spoken widely and, and commonly throughout Kleindeutschland, and that was not the case in other districts in New York, certainly not the case for the rest of the United States. The other element is that there's, there's certain cultural practices, expectations, and maybe, if you will, markets that exist in Little Germany that simply don't exist elsewhere. If you practiced a certain religion, you couldn't just go into any market, any grocery store, and expect that proprietor to have the good that you're looking for. However, if you're in and among your own kind, there's a far greater likelihood that you can find what you want. And so when the Mandelbaums set up the Clinton Street Dry Goods Store, more or less a peddler's shop, but it's transplanted from Germany to New York, they're doing so for a very good reason. This is a cultural practice that's familiar to the people in that community, and the Mandelbaums are relatively confident that they can ply their trade here in the United States. So, in a way, ghettoization is not always something that's forced on these individuals. Sometimes it's entered into on a voluntary uh, basis. But officially, what Frederica Mandelbaum is going to be known as, at least in law enforcement circles, is a professional fence. What is a fence, you ask? Well, today the best example that I would have for you would be a, an owner of a pawn shop. What a fence does is buys goods from people who are selling, okay, and then turns around and sells them to people primarily that are looking for a bargain, right? If you go to a pawn shop and you're looking for some sort of electronics, uh, there's probably a certain specific reason that you're, you're not ending up in, you know, a, a mainstream big box store. But in any case, it's essentially a middleman, or in Marm's case, it's a middle woman. And because she had years and years of experience back in Germany plying her trade, she was pretty good at it by the time that she got to the United States. And she, she just simply had this knack for buying low and selling high. And if you're wondering why she was so successful, you know, the fact that she was an experienced business owner is only one part of the story. The other part of it is the people that she's serving felt very, very comfortable with her. In so many ways, the Clinton Street Dry Goods Store was a safe space that served a community who otherwise didn't have anybody working for them. Marm never asked questions. She never asked questions like, you know, is this your property? She, she didn't ask questions like, how did you come to possess this property? And she absolutely never asked, is this stolen property? She just simply asked, how much would you like for whatever good it was that the individual was selling? And so she was going to become the first stop for low-income New Yorkers who were destitute. They knew that Marm was a safe person to go to. Her store was a safe place to operate. And if in the case of emergencies, you could go there and peddle something. You could go there and sell it. And so some of these New Yorkers are selling their own property to make ends meet. Some are selling stolen property. It didn't matter to Marm either way. She wasn't really interested in where this property came from. She was only interested in a good deal. But either way you want to look at this, the root cause is poverty. The root cause is inequality. Part of the reason that I spent so much time talking about the processes of immigration and the people who were coming were working in low-income jobs and were economic refugees in, in, in many instances, that is going to transfer over into their lives in the United States. Poverty is going to be very much a part of the immigrant experience uh, throughout the, the, the mid-19th century, 
And that's just going to be the reality of the situation for many, many people. The other aspect to this conversation is there really isn't anybody working for these individuals. It's a long, long time before we're going to see the establishment of an American welfare state. What I'm driving at here is there's really nobody that is an advocate for the working class immigrant population. And in a way, people like Marm are, are the heroes. They're the, the, the last stop that people have to really sort of save themselves. So you have to understand, amongst her own kind and amongst her own neighbors, she's really seen as a very good person, okay? Now, there's a reason that I settled on Frederica Mandelbaum, and it has nothing to do or little to do with the fact that she was a good peddler, good fence, that may be an illegal activity, and it may not, depending on what circumstance you're talking about. One of the biggest reasons that I focus on Mandelbaum is she's one of the earliest pioneers to organize crime. Let me explain. Mandelbaum is running a shop, a, a, a store that doesn't exactly get truckloads of, you know, goods, shipments in from its warehouse on a daily basis. If you want merchandise to continuously flow, you're going to have to have people out there in the street that are, quote unquote, cultivating it. And so what Mandelbaum's going to do, in pretty short order, is she's going to develop a network of pickpockets. And these individuals are going to provide a steady, steady stream of merchandise. Stolen merchandise, but that's another story for another time. Now, for buyers, what this meant was an alternative to these huge industrialists, robber barons they're called in, in, in the mid-19th century, a huge grip on the market. And in so many ways, they, they were monopolist. Uh, they were operating in a way that stifled competition. And the fact was, Marm was offering a, an alternative and a low-cost alternative to what otherwise would have been monopolistic uh, practices. But this network of pickpockets is ultimately going to, 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 to lead to more business for Marm. And I look at that as an early form of organizing crime. For the time being, I'd like to talk, go back to this whole issue of nowhere else to turn. The mid-19th century is, is, is usually referred to um, as the Gilded Age. I guess I should say it ranges from the mid-19th century to the late 19th century, but think about the time period after the Civil War and you'll be okay. Um, I mentioned a second ago a group of people called the Robber Barons. These are individuals that were captains of industry, and you can look at them in a celebratory way if you want to, but their business practices were anything but egalitarian. Uh, they ran their business as they saw fit. And one of the reasons for this is a process that historians and economists refer to as laissez-faire capitalism. The idea being there would be little, if any, regulation of the marketplace. And ultimately what this is going to do is it's going to allow these big producers like Carnegie Steel or Standard Oil to become huge and stamp out competition from anybody else, giving Standard Oil basically a monopoly on the market. Well, you go back and you ask yourself, who serves the needs of these lowly city dwellers? Who's actually out there looking out for their best interests? I go back to this idea of no regulation of the market. There's nobody that's really looking out for consumer safety standards. There's certainly nobody looking out for work safety standards. And so in a time period where a lot of these captains of industry are referred to as robber barons and more or less the villains of the American economy, someone like Frederica Marm Mandelbaum is really looked upon as a hero or heroine in her case. The other individuals that I'd like you to keep an eye on, because we'll come back to these people again and again, 
are ward bosses. And what these people are, are operators of political machines. What's a political machine, you ask? Well, generally speaking, I like to look at this as a relationship between the voter and the politician. I, the politician, promise you a favor, and in return for that favor, you give me your vote. And so, if you're someone like Frederica Mandelbaum and you want to operate your dry goods store, in some cases, that involves a license. In other cases, that involves the police maybe conveniently not being around your shop or not investigating your shop at specific times during the month, week, year, what have you. So, we've established the idea that Frederica Mandelbaum has organized crime. Now I'd like to go ahead and talk a little bit more about her coordination of crime. By now you can probably see why I chose Marm as an example of a pioneer of the early history of organized crime. By bringing together these pickpockets who were largely unorganized and, you know, existed in a very random and haphazard manner, by bringing them all together and getting them to work together, essentially what she provided herself and her business was a supply chain. It was a steady stream of merchandise being brought in, which didn't exactly exist before she brought that level of organization. And as I said from the beginning, organization is one of the key tenets of organized crime. It's what sets it apart from other forms of criminal activity. I also mentioned that coordination was a very important tenet of organized crime. And Marm was a master of coordinating with other individuals who brought special skills and skill sets that she simply didn't, uh, didn't, didn't have. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about how Marm is going to diversify her criminal activity in the aftermath of setting up this uh, dry goods store. One of the things that she branches into in the aftermath of her dry goods store getting up and running is financing bank robberies. And again, to do this, you're going to need a lot of people that are working together for a shared goal. And a lot of people are going to bring specific skills to this, uh, to this table. And so what Marm is going to do is she's going to finance individuals like George Leslie, who has this really, really good ability to crack codes that safes are going to use to lock up money in banks. In 1878, she's going to be involved in the Manhattan Savings Bank robbery, which was one of the more famous bank robberies in the history of New York. And she's going to be at the top with respect to providing the startup money and other resources that got other individuals similar to George Leslie involved in this. And it's going to be highly, highly effective. Later on, she's going to branch out and get involved in uh, the blackmailing game. She would employ confidence women. And if you're wondering what a confidence woman was, it was an individual who got a prominent person, usually a man, but not always, got a prominent person into a very compromised situation. If you have an individual who has some information that they wouldn't exactly like out there on the street for just anybody to know, uh, they're probably willing to pay a pretty hefty sum to keep that on the down low. And so if you can get some of these women to get uh, a prominent businessman or a prominent city official into a compromised situation, that's a pretty effective way of bringing in some extra money. So again, you've got individuals who are separate from one another, but each of them bring a skill set to the table and they're working in concert with one another. Over the course of time, what is going to come into formation is what historians refer to as Marm's Chicks. Now, these were individuals that were considerably younger than she was, hence the term chicks, as in baby chickens. 
And these are individuals that are essentially going to be in her employ and under her direction at the same time. You had people like Queen Liz or Big Mary Wallace who were professional pickpockets that were working to continue that supply chain that we were talking about a second ago. You had individuals like Sophie Lyons who was one of the more effective confidence women that was in the employ of Marm. You had Adam Worth who as you're going to find out was sort of a up from your bootstraps individual that eventually is going to become one of the more effective bank robbers under Marm's guidance. You have George Leslie, who we've already mentioned, but he's an individual with an uncanny ability to crack the codes of safes. Collectively, this group is referred to as Marm's Chicks because ultimately they are her employees and with her direction, she is going to employ this group of employees to effectively have a hand in, in, in many different criminal activities all at the same time. But one of the things that's probably the most impressive about Marm's ability to coordinate with other people is her vision to see the big picture and to play the long game. Eventually, she is going to establish the Grand Street School for Pickpockets. Essentially, what this is, is a training ground for the next generation of criminals of New York, all of whom are going to be under the guidance and direction of Mandelbaum. I can't say how impressive this was. It's, it's really, really incredible the way that she was able to pull this off. In a way, it almost functions similar to a baseball team's farm club. And I say club because it was multi-layered. At the A level, you had individuals that would learn how to become effective pickpockets. People from the street that were petty thieves that had heard one thing or another about Marm, she would bring these people in and explain to them how they could be even more effective in their ability to pick the pockets of New Yorkers on a day-to-day -day basis. And if you showed a little bit of promise in pickpocketing school, maybe they would bring you up to the double A club. And in the double A classes, what you'd get would be classes involving burglary or safe cracking, things of that variety. So you're essentially grad graduating to higher stakes games within the world of uh, uh, criminality. Ultimately, you would be graduating to the AAA club. You can think of this almost like a doctoral class. Uh, and in those classes, you'd be trained in the art of blackmail and other competent schemes. And so it's a multi-levered, tiered uh, program that Marm is using to essentially not only coordinate, but also to develop the criminal talents of individuals who are showing promise on the streets of New York. Before we go on, let me give you a quick example. Uh, the bank robber that I mentioned a minute ago, Adam Worth, is really going to get his start as a pickpocket. And because Marm saw some promise and some potential in that individual, she's going to use him to recruit other pickpockets. But over the course of time, and certainly under the guidance of Mandelbaum, he's going to quote unquote graduate. And it's not going to be long before he's putting schemes together with George Leslie to knock off banks. And so Marm also represents a really important tenant of organized crime, and that's the ability to be able to work with other individuals who has skill sets that she didn't necessarily have, but in the big picture made her organization a far more effective criminal organization. If you're keeping track, Marm is very clearly at the top of her class when it comes to those tenets of organized crime that we were talking about at the beginning of this episode. Organization, very clearly pulling an A. Coordination, probably an A+. And as you're about to find out, she very much is a force to be reckoned with when it comes to getting those in positions of power to acquiesce and look the other way as she's doing her bidding. But for this to make any sense, you have to understand that police work and policing is not really the modern version that we think of it as today. It's something that is going to evolve. It's a profession that's going to evolve over the course of 
at least 100 years. To get what we think of as the NYPD, uh, you're looking at at least a few years deep into the 20th century. But when cities like New York, and certainly Philadelphia and Boston would be right there with them, when they begin to boom and they begin to spread out, and you begin to see the process of urbanization unfold, what you get is the law of unanticipated consequences. Uh, for example, you know, health and safety standards in cities, living uh, standards, that's very quickly going to prove to be a problem in the city with everybody living on top of one another. And policing, enforcing laws, even laws that are on the books, is going to be much easier said than done. And even the Dutch are going to figure this out relatively quickly. Uh, in New Amsterdam, the Dutch had established what came to be known as the Night Watch. And this was basically just a patrol that would round up hooligans and people that were in the process of breaking the law, but it wasn't really a professional police force like we would associate a professional police force. Later on, you get the Municipal Police Act of 1844, and certainly that is going to provide a more professional police force in New York, but it's still very highly susceptible to corruption. Police were not paid especially well at that time. I think you might be able to make a case that police are still not paid adequately, or at least that's uh, not something that's going to be lost on a lot of people. And as such, it made them very susceptible, very vulnerable to taking bribes. And police work lent itself to political favors not that much different than what we were talking about with those political machines. When you were making your rounds and, you know, there were places that were more than likely hot spots for criminal activity, if you simply avoided those places, especially at certain times, uh, well, that wasn't you breaking the law. That was simply, you know, you not being in the right place at the right time. And so when you get visionaries like Marm that begin to understand that by paying police and by identifying those police officers who might be most receptive to a bribe, you can operate more or less unrestricted and even out in the open as long as you're paying off the right people and as long as you're getting these police officials to be in the right place at the right time. So let me give you a quick example. The 8th Ward Thieves Exchange was located at the corner of Broadway and Houston in New York. And what this was, was a, think of it sort of like a criminal market. It was a place where people brought merchandise, most of which was stolen, uh, and they dickered and they dealed. Uh, it changed hands. Sometimes it changed hands several times. And every once in a while, there would be raids and people would be arrested for it. But Marm was never one of these people, and there's a very good reason as to why. She always knew which hands needed to have that $100 handshake, and miraculously, when Marm was conducting business at the Thieves' Exchange, there wasn't a cop, there wasn't a police officer in sight. And this is really going to put Marm ahead of her time with respect to how she understands the world of crime. In a way, it's, it's a commodity. Crime is a commodity to be bartered. You can pay people for their services and you can employ the services of other people. And police officers happen to be one of those groups that Marm employed over the course of her criminal career. And she was very effective at it. That leaves one last category, one last tenant, uh, with respect to effective uh, success in organized crime. And as I said before, that's not standing out. And I think initially, if you want to think of it as the first half of the semester, right, Marm's clearly getting an A. 
She uses a lot of discretion. She is not very flamboyant in terms of her actions, and she knows what people need to look the other way and what people are okay. But over the course of time, word got out. And when I say word got out, the media begins to pick up on how successful this woman happened to be. The New York World was one of the oldest newspapers in New York City, and it had identified Marm as a criminal mastermind. As a matter of fact, and I'm quoting it here, it proclaimed that, quote, she was the greatest crime promoter of all time, end quote. The person who, quote, put crime in America on a syndicated basis, end quote. And, quote, nucleus and center of the whole organization of crime in New York City, end quote. What's worse is that Marm's name had gotten out across the country. In 1871, Chicago is going to experience one of the worst disasters in its history. It's going to have a fire, the Great Chicago Fire, that's going to more or less levy the city. Um, what you're going to see is people running into buildings, people trying to salvage whatever they're able to salvage, and sometimes these are the owners of homes and dwellings, and sometimes they're not. If you've ever seen that film, Gangs of New York, with Leonardo DiCaprio, um, you'll have an understanding as to what I'm talking about. When there's the fire, he's rushing into somebody else's home, and they're just picking up whatever valuables that they possibly can come across, and they're selling them on the black market. And that was happening in Chicago as well, but these individuals are finding their way back to New York, and they're selling them to Mandelbaum. Now, it was a good place to, to sell your products, but it was also a really great place to buy products at the same time. On average, word had gotten out that she was offering wholesale prices for things that you couldn't find on every street corner. It was estimated that you would pay a fifth of the wholesale price that you would if you did this on the up and up. If you bought from Marm, you very clearly got a, uh, got, got a huge discount. Now, the fact that she's becoming a household name and she is in the media, and she's more or less a national figure, it's not lost on Mandelbaum. And she had devised ways to kind of cover her tracks. A uh, quick example, she had a uh, secret chimney that was used to stash away, used to hide stolen merchandise in a pinch when, when, a, when a police officer was roaming around, was patrolling that particular area, or if there was another official that just so happened to be in that place at that time, it was a quick and effective way to hide things. She also employed a team of engravers to doctor up jewelry so that it couldn't be as recognized if in case someone ever reported it to the police and they came by her stop. Um, cab drivers for quick getaways, expensive legal defense attorneys, including the famous attorney Big Bill Howell of uh, Howell and Hummel. And so in ways she's aware that she's, she's standing out a lot more than she would like to, but there's not a whole lot that she can do about it. Eventually, she's going to attract the attention of the New York District Attorney, a guy by the name of Peter Olm Onley. With all the press and attention that Marm was getting, it's not as if the New York District Attorney, Peter Onley, could just sit back and do nothing. He had to come after her in some meaningful way. At the same time, we're seeing the evolution of the Pinkerton Detective Agency, who's really going to get their start in Gilded Age labor conflict. Uh, they're going to be deployed um, in, in certain instances to break up strikes and work stoppages. But as the decade wore on, uh, they are going to gravitate more and more toward law enforcement. And Onley's going to rely on the Pinkertons to really take down Mandelbaum. The guy at the center of this situation is a detective known as Gustav Frank, or as Mandelbaum knew him, Gustav Stein. 
He spoke German. Uh, he certainly looked the part. And quite honestly, Mandelbaum trusted him. She let her guard down, if you will, but not in the way that you think. Um, as the story goes, Gustav offered her some expensive silk, offered to sell her some expensive silk that he had come to acquire. Marm didn't exactly take that bait. But what she did do over the course of time is make Stein her confidant. And she told him things that she had no business telling him, including where numerous warehouses where she kept stolen goods as they were waiting to be processed for sale in her dry goods store, where those warehouses were located. Well, Stein takes this information back to his bosses, and the Pinkertons kick it up to Onley, who in November of 1884 is going to press charges against Mandelbaum. Those warehouses are discovered. It's pretty obvious that there's stolen merchandise on the inside, and Marm is arrested. Now, as you know, she employs a team of high-powered attorneys to get her off the hook for just such occasions. But somewhere in between the time that she was arrested and the time that she was supposed to go on trial, Mandelbaum is going to make a statement. And I'm quoting her here in that, quote, I keep a dry goods store and have for the past 20 years. I buy and sell dry goods as other dry goods people do. I've never knowingly bought stolen goods. I have never stolen anything in my life. I feel that these charges are brought against me for spite. I've never bribed the police. I am innocent of these charges, so help me God. The thing of it was, Mandelbaum didn't stick around to face the music. She went on the lam. Most people agree that she landed in Hamilton, Ontario, where it was rumored that she had picked up where she left off in New York. But the thing about Canada was it was a destination for many American criminals, primarily because it didn't have a very good track record of handing them over when American authorities requested such. In any case, she's never caught, even though she came back to New York, uh, New York State that is, to witness a funeral for a family member who was very close to her. But that was about the closest that Mandelbaum ever came to getting caught. In any case, it's a relatively unceremonious ending to an otherwise stellar criminal career in the history of organized crime. There's a few things that I want to do before we wrap up and conclude this first episode. And they involve not only tying some things together uh, for this episode, but it, think of it sort of as a launching pad for future episodes to come. By now, it really should be obvious why I chose to use Marm Mandelbaum as an example of a pioneer of organized crime uh, in the United States. And part of that involves she really is a great example of those four tenets of organized crime that we were talking about at the beginning of this episode. She was very well organized. Uh, she was probably even better at bringing people with different skill sets in and coordinating with those people. So, you know, she's probably even better at coordination. She was really good at recognizing what people were in charge of what city municipality service, uh, getting the powers that be to look the other way and acquiesce. Uh, to her will uh, and, and not necessarily stand out in the process. Speaking of which, she did a pretty good job, at least for the early part of her career, in not standing out and not getting noticed. But as fate would have it, it would be that reputation and ultimately her success that led to her downfall. Once more and more people stopped to take note of how good she was doing that ultimately brought in the attention of law enforcement as we have discussed um so 
Essentially, Mandelbaum took crime and organized it for her own personal profit. And for many years, she had quite a bit of success in doing so. The individuals that follow this episode are going to bear a lot in common with Marm Mandelbaum. And in a way, she's a good point of reference for our investigation of the history of organized crime. The other thing I want to do as we wrap up is really underscore the point that crime, organized or otherwise, really is going to grow out of these conditions of the Gilded Age. Uh, keep in mind that the poverty, the inequality, uh, the dangerous living conditions, the oppressive working conditions, all are going to contribute to these networks that Mandelbaum are going to tap into. Keep in mind, we are talking about a time period where the government doesn't really work for the people that need it the most. Uh, if you know anything about this time period in American history, uh, part of the reason that it's called the Gilded Age is because of its shallow values. The government essentially works for people who can afford to buy it the most effectively, and that's not the people that Mandelbaum deals with in many instances. In, in most cases, these are people that are at the end of their rope, uh, they're relatively desperate, they don't have anywhere else to turn, and so, you know, in another way, Mandelbaum not only is providing a service that otherwise would not be available to these people, but in a way, she is sort of a heroine, um, at least to the individuals that need her anyway. So, in our upcoming episode, you're going to see a lot more of the same. Uh, you are going to see inequality and certainly poverty that is giving rise to not only crime, but eventually organized crime. Thank you for joining us for our first episode of An Offer You Can't Refuse, The History of Organized Crime in the United States. I told you from the beginning that this would be an academic approach to investigating the history of organized crime. And what kind of academician would I be if I didn't cite my sources? What I'd like to do before we go is uh, offer up some tips on further reading, assuming for a second I've piqued your interest on one topic or another. Um, it cannot be said enough. Uh, J. North Conway's Queen of Thieves, the true story of Marm Mandelbaum and her gangs of New York is a book that has offered up a wealth of knowledge to me. As you can imagine, it's really been, you know, the heart of this first episode. And if you want to know more about Mandelbaum's life and story, I highly recommend that book. This is an oldie but a goodie. Uh, Jacob Reese's How the Other Half Lives is a really incredible piece in investigative journalism with respect to living conditions in the late 19th century. Uh, Reese is one of these investigative journalists, and what he does is he investigates the conditions in New York's dumbbell tenements. And if you read Reese, it's really going to be illuminative with respect to, you know, how oppressive these conditions were, how those oppressive conditions led to inequality, and how inequality led to crime in many instances. Another oldie but goodie is Oscar Handlin's The Uprooted. To date, I really can't think of a better history of Gilded Age immigration and immigration processes. This is also very illuminative with respect to the individuals and characters that we're talking about. And if you read it, it's going to help you understand uh, the social and political conditions of the late 19th century. Last, certainly not least, Ryan Derringer's the, fi the Filth, let's start that over. Ryan Deeringer's The Filth of Progress, Immigrants, Americans, and the Building of Canals and Railroads. As I said in the beginning of this episode, um, our economy would not have been able to function had it not been for immigrant labor. And Deeringer makes a very good case for that as well, and also illuminates various elements of the second-class citizenship suffered by many of these laborers. 
that's all for right now. I hope you'll come back and you'll join us for uh, episode two of An Offer You Can't Refuse. If you do, you're going to find that the individual's probably somebody that you could have conceived before you thought about listening to this podcast, but the setting might surprise you. Hope to hear back from you soon.